Today on the show, we use the names Thomas Hobbes and Erdnot Rex in the very same sentence. Welcome to Lore Party, the podcast that explores the stories, characters, and universes behind some of our favorite video games. I'm Abu. I'm Kevin. And I'm Leo. He's back. Yeah, Leo's back with us today, and we are back on this podcast to talk about an extremely, extremely important topic, the Mueller investigation. Oof. Wait, I don't remember that character. Is he from Mass Effect 3? It's from Mass Andromeda. Effect 2. Andromeda. Oh, that's why I don't know him. Yeah, yeah, Gosh. he's the black sheep. okay so in reality we are actually here to talk about an incredibly important topic in the mass effect universe and that's the genophage one of the biggest moral conundrums in the entire universe i would say it's one of those topics that's brought up in the game you're told a little bit about it and you meet some characters to whom it's very important but for as deep of a topic as this is it's kind of incredible how quickly we move past it in the game yeah, that's really true. It it sort of lives constantly in the background. And maybe lives isn't the wrong word. Looms is probably the better word there. It, it's this ever-present thing that looms in the background and comes to a head in Mass Effect 3, and it becomes a critical part of that game. Yeah, it's constantly talked about with every single Krogan you meet, <laughs> no matter what they mention it, at least once. Right. <laughs> I mean, Kevin, you got to cut them some slack. Like, they are going instant. Like, they are on the road to extinction because of this thing. Oh, no, I love, me, I love me some Krogans, man. They're my favorite. <laughs> I, Rex all the way, man. He's my bro. <laughs> well, he's definitely going to come up in this conversation for sure. But I think before we dive too deep into the genophage and the, the ethics around it and whether it was right or wrong, I think we should get uh, our listeners caught up on exactly what it is, what the history is behind it. So... At its very basic, the genophage is simply a biological weapon that was created by the Salarians to deter the Krogans during the Krogan rebellions. Now, the Turians were at war with the Krogans when they began to rebel against the Council. And the Salarians created this biological weapon to essentially sterilize the Krogan population because every, for every you know one Krogan that the Turians would take down, two more would pop up in their place just because they were... They were, you know, the birth rates are just so crazy. And that's exactly it. The birth rates of Krogans is, they're crazy. So this is something that, this is why it was kind of planned as an effective weapon, because this would cut off what many considered was their greatest strength, is there just so many Krogans. Yeah, so to put that in hard numbers, I think it's important to know how much it actually cut off when it comes to those birth rates. The genophage, once it was implemented, made it so that only one in every 1,000 eggs successfully became a baby Krogan. And when I said the words baby Krogan, a weird, weird image formed in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Little bat, shark, infant. Mm, adorable. Lizard thing. I don't know what they are. Yeah. But it's important to know that like that is how much of an effect the genophage had on the population. It's also important to note that the Salarians didn't want to use this. It, it was up to the Turians at the end of the day to pull the trigger and use it against the Krogan. And the biggest reason for that for the Turians was essentially the Krogan were not backing down. There were massive casualties on both sides of the Krogan rebellion, and it just seemed like this endless bloody war that was going nowhere. And I think you brought up the good point that it was something that was presented to the Krogans as a deterrent, like, hey, don't continue taking our planets because what they had begun doing is they started expanding their growing numbers to other planets that were owned by or inhabited by members of the council species so the council was like hey you know back down you're now you're waging war on some of our families you need to stop and the krogan representative like storms out of the room angry yeah. and it's like what do you expect man like they they have to draw the line in the sand somewhere you know yeah, and and I when I was doing a lot of the prep work for this episode, I realized that it's pretty obvious that some of the inspiration for the genophage and the Krogan rebellions came from World War II and the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, sort of that 
ultimatum to end a war that didn't seem like it would end, where neither side was ready to back down or surrender. And the parallels there are pretty striking when you when you think about it. The Turians offered that the Krogans surrender and end the war and end the conflict. The Krogans didn't show any signs of backing down. When it came to the to the Allied forces in World War II, it was the same against the the Japanese in the Pacific Theater. Another parallel there is how much this is debated. I mean, we still have conversations about the use of nuclear weapons in World War II, whether or not it was too far. I mean, it was almost all civilian casualties. There are so many reasons why it was terrible to do that. And in the world of Mass Effect, it's the same, where people are kind of one side or the other. And obviously, a lot of the people who maybe had family who were victims to Krogan violence had their strong opinions. But the whole the whole game presents it as this t- terrible thing that happened that, you know, when you're given the choice later on to end it, it really is a, a you know, viable option to end the genophage. Right. And I think that that transitions us nicely into uh, the big decision that Bioware puts in Shepard's lap and threw Shepard in your lap as the gamer is whether or not to end the genophage. And that is a really interesting thing that I want to ask both of you about because I am of the opinion that Bioware presented a pretty skewed view of the genophage and what who was right or wrong in that conflict. But I, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on how Bioware presented that sort of the morality around using the genophage. So for me, the whole thing is perception. So think of it like this. The Krogan, usually they have a thousand eggs that they can fertilize a year. That's a lot of babies. And now they can only have one. So for a species that's used to having so many, now has so little, to them, it's like detrimental. Oh my God, we're going to go extinct. And, and, and don't get me wrong, their numbers were really freaking low. But it's all about perception. Well, and I think to your question, Abu, I think Bioware absolutely presents this very skewed perspective of the, the genophage. Like the more I looked into it, because I went into it with my feelings about it based on the game. I loved Rex as a character. When he first comes in, that first scene is so funny to me. So I loved Rex, and I really enjoyed the kind of banter with the other Krogan characters that you meet. But the more I looked into it and the more I looked at the history, I really feel like maybe unintentionally, maybe intentionally, the Bioware team, when they gave us this narrative, they were like, here's this terrible biophage that was awful, and oh my gosh, it's so sad and terrible. But then you look into the history and there's a lot of elements that are not so clearly defined. Right. You, like you said, you look into the history of it and you realize that this terrible thing was maybe justifiable, question mark. And right. those justifications, Bioware does not really lay at your feet in, during the games. You have to do some digging in the codex and the expanded lore to learn about the decision making process up to the point of using the genophage. So it is interesting that Bioware seems to be presenting a pretty skewed view of the genophage. And I do I want to contrast that actually with how they present the cure as well. Because you get a you get a squad mate in Morden who had a hand in he didn't create the original genophage, but he upgraded it because Krogan over the past century has started to become resistant to it. So he helped create Genophage 2.0 to make sure that they don't you know, build up that resistance 100%. He's had a hand in it, and you sort of learn the guilt that he's living with. He goes through this ultimate redemption arc in actually curing the genophage in Mass Effect 3. You don't really see the Krogan side of that story. You don't get that emotional story from a Krogan about how the genophage is affecting them. The only time you ever really get any kind of true story from Krogan's is in Mass Effect 3 because you're actually going to their planet and you see them struggling, you see how it is, and that's really when you start, when you meet the female Krogan who's actually very fertile and they're kind of like, ooh, whoa, watch out. But that's that's the whole thing is you start kind of getting closer to these people and understanding how they think and how they view uh, the world and it's... It, it, 
opens up like, oh, this is what they're going through. Yeah, but I would argue that even in the in the way Bioware presents enemies in Mass Effect One, in Mass Effect Two, especially in Mass Effect Three, there are Krogan enemies in all three of those games. You fight these Krogans, they go berserk on you. They're one of the toughest sort of mob enemies in the game that you actually Mm -hmm. play in the gameplay as well. I can't off the top of my head think of a significant Solarian that I fought who wasn't just maybe like a one-off, like part of some some gang on Omega, you know? Like I cannot think of a Solarian bad guy that stood out in my mind. Yeah, like scientist number three in like the fourth <laughs> lab who's like, mm, stop, please. And you shoot him twice and he's dead. And then a, and then a Krogan comes in and you're like, ah, oh, man, this sucks. I have to kill a Krogan. They're so strong. They're really. They are the most OP race in the game. <laughs> well, maybe maybe the whole game and maybe the reason that they present us this kind of skewed representation of the genophage is because. Eventually, you have to make that decision, right? So if Bioware hadn't given us this very skewed perspective of the genophage, if maybe they gave us a lot of the information that at least I have found, it for me, at the time of getting to that moment, I would have been, well, and I don't want to spoil my opinion on it, but I'll just say, I would have very strongly considered not curing the genophage, personally. Yeah, you know? well, well, I'm actually interested, based off of the way that the story and the first three games presents the genophage, what were your guys' decisions when it came to that level and when it came to curing the genophage? What did you decide to do? I had two. Um, The first playthrough, I cured it. And then Morden died. And I was like, what the fuck? I love this guy. I mean, he's he's a great guy. Um, So I played the game, finished the game, and I watched the ending. And I kind of had an idea about what was going to happen with the Krogan. And they, all of a sudden, become this really advanced race. And they're more peaceful than they used to be. And their planet starts to get better. And and I thought, okay, okay, okay. So that my next playthrough, I convinced Morden there is a way to do this. To convince Morden to hold off on curing them until the end of the reapers but it sounds like at the end of the day both playthroughs you chose to cure it ultimately oh yeah i mean i felt like the genophage was almost this species breaking of the wall you know what i mean for the next step because they kind of understood what they did wrong leo do you agree with kevin well maybe not agree but what did you ultimately end up doing during your playthroughs So I think this is going to curtail nicely into the next thing, but I loved Rex as a character and I really just didn't want Rex to be sad. So I cured (laughs) the genophage because I just didn't want to bum out my buddy Rex. And that was it. But now that I've done this research and now that I've had time to really think about it, I don't think I would. I think I would, I would leave it in place but only because of uh, some things that I think we'll talk about a little bit later. But I'll, I'll leave it that that. Yeah, I think I agree with you a little bit on that. But ultimately, I ended up doing what Kevin did during both of my... Well, I played the game a couple of times, but I honestly cannot remember any playthrough where I actually either tricked the Krogan and didn't cure them or stopped Morden from curing the Genophage. Like, I think every time it came to that critical decision point in the game, I ultimately chose to cure it. And I think a big part of that was because it was presented to me as the right thing to do, the moral thing to Mm do. And the game doesn't really tell you what the ultimate result of that decision will be. And, you know, the galaxy itself probably won't see the ultimate result of that decision for a couple generations until that birth rate starts to pick up again. For me, a big aspect was also how Morden felt. He's the guy who created it. And he knew what he was doing. And he kind of said, hey, I fucked up. I shouldn't have done this. I can see, understand why I shouldn't have done this. So that takes, I take that into account. Well, and let's keep in mind, this is the guy who designed the bullet that was fired, right? So whether or not it was the right thing to do, I think the idea of him having developed it initially as the 
preventative measure and then ultimately someone else deciding to use that to decimate this species, I can understand his personal guilt and his desire to undo what was done against his will, but maybe with the understanding that someone else might step in with a solution if the Krogans got out of control, right? Like, it's not necessarily binary. You're not either with the genophage and they're not a problem for the galaxy, or there's no genophage and they are. Maybe he was just saying, no, the genophage as a whole, I regret, and let me take it back. Right. Maybe there was a little bit of maturity and understanding there that the genophage may have not been the perfect solution right. to a problem. It right. might have actually been too much of a solution or may, may have overstepped the uh, original problem and created way more than there were to begin with. Right. And keep in mind, like, if you look at, Bioware did a great job of this. If you look at the Krogans as a species, they are a byproduct of the terrible planet they came from. The reason female Krogans can lay up to a thousand fertilized eggs per year is because so many young Krogans died on Tachanka. You know, the, I, I thought it was so interesting that it's mentioned their eyes are on either side of their head and they, the eyes being where they are is usually on prey species because they need to be able to see more of their surroundings because they're so often hunted by things. So the Krogans have these qualities of a prey species, even though relative to every other planet, they're super powerful. You know, they come into the room and you're like, oh, oh no, not another one. I have to pull out my shotgun or whatever. <laughs> I do want to ask both of you, if we were to blow this up big picture and start talking some hypotheticals, do you think, so we all decided in our playthroughs for the most part to cure the genophage. Do you think that would have led to a peaceful galaxy? Or are the Krogan doomed to repeat the mistakes of their past? We keep talking about it being a step too far. Morden points something out at one point that he thinks that it, the, the numbers are declining steadily over time of, of Krogans. If they stopped exploring the universe and fighting and battling and they focused on repopulating, he thinks they could. But a lot of them have given up that as a possibility. But I think, and you know, this, this gets pretty uh, topical, I think, to our current, current climate in the world. I think that it, they will repeat themselves eventually because initially what caused the extinction that was impending was Krogans fighting Krogans in order to claim resources, which you, we see plenty of in Mass Effect 2 and 3. And that escalates and that escalates and eventually just like we uh, America did in, in uh, World War II, they drop nuclear bombs, but in their case, it causes a winter that's going to wipe them all out. And this is something that, like, that's not a great track record. Their track record is just violence and fighting and combat. And I don't necessarily see that changing, or I don't see any reason why that would change. That's interesting because I have a little bit of a different take. And I think I would... For the most part, I would agree with you, but I would disagree on the potential future of the Krogan after the genophage is cured. But Kevin, I wanted to hear your thoughts first. Do you think having cured the genophage, the galaxy you created in your playthroughs is off to a better future? Um, I actually would agree with you, Abu, because I feel like they learned their lesson almost. they The whole thing is I think the Reapers have a more more of an impact than just like we're coming to kill you like they, they they bring all the races together obviously the enemy of my enemy is my friend and the the common enemy situation creates interesting things uh, interesting dynamics but the uh, the krogan kind of understand that it, it's more than just them now and especially with the right leader like with Rex, for instance, that makes a big difference. I'm glad you brought up Rex because I actually wanted to pose this question to you guys too. Do you think r the leader of the Krogan, once the genophage has been cured, is important? Absolutely. Rex versus Reeve. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But I, the reason that doesn't necessarily weigh heavily on my predictions of the Krogan future post genophage is because. Rex unified a lot of Krogans, but not all of them. 
And Krogans, if they're fully reproductive, can have thousands of little Krogan babies <laughs> who grow up real quick. And now you've got these new factions who maybe think, no, uh, the, uh, the, the council species haven't paid their, their due to us. What they did to us isn't fair. We should take more of their, their stuff. I would actually disagree with Leo on their future. I don't think that they will fall entirely back to their old ways of accidentally nuking themselves, causing a, a nuclear winter on their planet. I think that action and that past is a direct result of Tuchanka and the environment that they grew up in. I think a galactic future where the genophage has been cured where Rex is leading them, because I do think that is ultimately important. One unifying leader like Rex that can inspire all these different clans to come together and sort of chase this ultimate goal and dream is so important to the Krogan in achieving that dream. Reeve, I don't think, could be that inspirational. But ultimately, I think they could achieve that dream given the opportunity to exist outside of a brutal world like Tuchanka. Well, so... Totally fair, you know, agree to disagree. But the, uh, <laughs> no, and I, and I do feel myself, I'm kind of in that in-between space where I don't know if I would strongly stand by my, my earlier statement, but I, you know, it, it kind of, that's how it feels. But what I would ask you then, turning, ar turning it around, the reason they're so fertile and the reason they have so many kids is because they had this extremely low turnaround of, you know, fertilized egg becoming a baby Krogan, which then probably dies. So in this post-genophage world where every surviving female Krogan could be putting out thousands of Krogans yeah, a year, yeah. what what is the end game? Why would Krogans as a species not continue growing? And can, they, they would. I mean, even peacefully, they would spread to different planets. They would find uninhabited places, sure. They would terraform rocks. But eventually there's a, there is a carrying capacity of every planet and there's a carrying capacity of every solar system and the Krogans as a species have had all of their limiting things taken away. Yeah, that I mean, that is an, a really strong argument for your case. Uh, their, their biology, the very bodies that they have sort of evolved into have been created to combat Tuchanka. Once they're outside of Tuchanka, there's no more rules. Like they can pr produce and reproduce and ne these young Krogans can grow to adulthood at an alarming rate. And you're right. Eventually space and resources on a planet will run out and they will have to find other planets to make habitable and colonize. So uh, that's a really strong argument. And I don't know if I have a <laughs> strong counter argument to that in all honesty. Like that is a huge concern when it comes to sort of unshackling and letting the the Krogan uh, come to fruition with no no barriers. And that's why I would say the counter argument to this would be the exact question Abu is saying. The leader. Is the leader the one who is um, influencing all of this? And I think it is. Like, Rex gets it. It's, 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 um, he's just basically saying, all right, we need some rules, people. Like, our planet's getting back to the way things were. Um, it's becoming more habitable. We have other planets that are way more habitable than Tachanka. We need rules to be set in place. Like, kind of, I mean, like how China has the one child or had the one child situation. Population control is going to be a major aspect of a post genophage Krogan world. Right. And I agree with Kevin that that is one potential solution to the problem, Leo, that you are presenting is. If the Krogans were sort of given that seat at the council table, would they be willing to negotiate some sort of population control, knowing that biologically they are able to reproduce at, at a rate that alarms the rest of the galaxy? Would they, would they be politically motivated to agree to some sort of population control rules? Well, and I would say, just like it, as happened in China for many years, parents would quietly have more than one child. I mean, people break the rules all the time. And when it's one child every nine months, that's one thing. When it's a thousand children per year, it's another thing. But I think, I think where I can, we, where we can kind of find common ground, a solution that would be viable is an adjusted genophage, something that doesn't 
reduce it to one in a thousand, but maybe makes it one in a hundred, so that even the most the 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 most disobedient uh, clan of Krogans who want to overpopulate and destroy the universe, maybe they can only pump out ten Krogans a year, you know, or something like that. Introduce some Trojan condoms. I don't know. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's some what Mass Cro- Effect needs. Krogan condoms. Dude, oh, yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> Damn. Triple XL. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that's definitely I think a happy medium. And I think Rex of all the Krogan we come across in the Mass Effect universe would probably the be the only one that would be willing to sit down at the negotiating table and come to that agreement is a partial genophage that doesn't entirely decimate the population and lets the Krogan sort of come back and like raise their population back up to like not near extinction but also doesn't scare the rest of the galaxy. And I agree. I think it all comes down, and we've all said this at this point, it all comes down to the leader and who makes those sort of really tough decisions that keep the worst inhibitions of the Krogan in line. Right. Now, another question that this sort of leads us to, speaking of the, the worst instincts of the Krogan, do we think, and this gets a little bit more philosophical, but... Do we think Krogan are inherently this aggressive race, or is that a byproduct of their environment? I think that definitely their biology of aggressiveness is attributed to their planet, 100%. I do think that they are caring uh, and have that capacity for just nonviolence. I mean... I would say the biggest number one uh, example is, um, I can't remember her name, but the female Krogan from e? Mass Effect, yes, from Mass Effect 3. She is kind, polite, She's she's got to be, you know, she's strong, she's a very strong individual, she can be aggressive when she wants to, but that's not, it, do, it doesn't seem like that's her nature almost, and... I mean, even Rex shows care for her. He he even talks about, like, we need to protect the young ones that we have left. We need to protect... Like, he's very into giving a shit about other people. Like, that's just who he is. And I, I feel like it's hit or miss, just like with humans. I think it, I think it's very similar. And I think they definitely have the potential to create a good world, a, peace, a peaceful-ish world. Because, I mean... Spoiler alert, the ending, for instance, shows them creating a really good environment and new planet, but still. Leo, do you agree with that? Do you believe in the innate goodness of man and Krogan? I guess I would say I think they have as much potential for good as any species, as Kevin pointed out a few times. Eve and Rex have both many times demonstrated a willingness to work together a willingness to take care of things and to protect and to do things that we can all agree are good. So I don't think they're limited by their biology, but I do think it's, it's worth keeping in mind that, you know, if you ask a human to do something, we often work with our intellect and our hands and we try to figure out a solution to the puzzle because that's one of the things that we evolved as a species. If you ask a Krogan in this peaceful future to solve a problem, well, they might use their extra heart to, <laughs> I don't know, do something. They yeah, might. Yeah, they might find a use for that extra heart outside of just an edge in combat. So what I find interesting in both of your responses is you guys brought up individuals. You, you guys brought up Eve. You guys brought up Rex and the other Krogan that we come across that are sort of this positive force in the Krogan race. What I want to bring up is the fact that taken as a whole, whole because of the genophage because of tuchanka because of the battles that they have been raised for and brought up to the galactic stage for the krogan are at this point inherently this aggressive battle ready race so i think the species taken as a whole would probably be more in line with maybe the ideology of somebody like thomas hobbs who believed that man was naturally wicked. So without rules and restrictions, without shackles like the genophage, the Krogan species in its entirety would find some way to cause 
a lot of havoc in the galaxy. But when it comes down to single ind individuals and inspirational leaders that these Krogan can fall in line behind and look up to, like Rex and Eve, I think the ide ideology would fall more in line with somebody like uh, Rousseau, who believes that man is naturally good or has goodness in him, but is corrupted by external forces in society. So I think there's actually two ways to maybe look at that problem at an individual level and as an entire species. So I think one of the best examples of this in terms of a blank slate is the one Krogan we didn't talk about, Grunt. He is considered the ultimate Krogan, and he's, you know, he's a vat baby. That's what he is. He's, he's. He was a created a biological... He's himself a biological weapon. He's a biologically made Krogan that was not obviously made in the fun, reproductive, conventional means. Um, <laughs> but he's brand spanking new, and he was not, you know, a part of Krogan um, society. And, I mean, he was definitely fed stuff uh, in his creation... Uh, I guess, if you will, like when he was in the vat, they instituted the information of the society and what it's like to live in the society. And then when he's born, he is inherently aggressive. But he's also very curious. And he's semi-polite to Shepard. And, and I feel like maybe the societal aspect is what really caused him to be aggressive because... That's all he knew from what he was given. I love that you brought that up. He's He is the blank slate Krogan that learns two different routes to solving a problem. And one route is combat, the thing that he's bred for. And the other route through she Shepard, he potentially learns diplomacy and negotiation. I, I think we could all agree that that ultimately speaks to the potential for a positive future for the Krogan. But... To Leo's point from earlier, I think it would require some rules, regulations, and controls on the natural biological factors of, of Krogan physiology. I'd also like to take a step back and appreciate how much I had no idea we'd be talking about Krogan's having sex this much <laughs> <laughs> during the podcast. I was like, genophage, biological weapons, ethics, you know? But really, sex. it just comes down to... Krogan's getting nasty and, yep. you know, maybe maybe a, a, <laughs> a, some giant Krogan condom is necessary. Right. The condom to save the galactic. <laughs> 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 oh, can't, can't, can't even finish the sentence. Can't even finish it. <laughs> <laughs> the condom that will save the galaxy. Shepard, we have a new mission. <laughs> Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. We want to thank you for tuning in to this extremely long elevator pitch for Krogan condoms and being a part of our show. Be sure to connect with us on Twitter at lore underscore party and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.